You've heard the people transported to Australia as criminals. Today, I'm going to tell you the story of a Scotsman who went to Australia and then became a criminal and a local hero. So if you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. In the meantime, let me tell you his story. Our story starts in Duthel near Abbey Moor on the 27th of August 1841 with the birth of a child named James McPherson. So why am I at the Botanic Gardens in Brisbane? I'll be honest, there are two other places that I really wanted to take you but neither were quite feasible. Crestbrook Station, two hours west of here, was a livestock station and is one of the oldest places in Queensland. It's also where our story really gets going. But they never responded to my request to go down there and film. Uh, and I don't fancy driving for two hours just to be told to sod off. That blind date in Aberdeen was enough for me. Anyway, when James was 12, his parents took him and his nine siblings from the Cairngorms to Australia. Daddy McPherson went to work for DC McConnell of Crestbrook. Our hero James helped out in the station, learned to ride horses and shoot rifles. But the family eventually bought property at Bald Hills and James got some schooling in Ipswich. I, I know, that sounds like a long walk home for lunch. But it turns out there's an Ipswich outside Brisbane where James's diligence, intelligence, oratory skills and fluency in languages made him a model pupil. Will he be a diplomat, a politician, a minister perhaps? He became an apprentice builder. He also went to the Brisbane Mechanics School at night where he was a prominent debater. Oh, maybe that role as an MP could come yet. But no. In 1863, McPherson ran away and worked in various livestock stations, honing those equestrian skills and becoming an accurate shot. What profession was he practising for now, I wonder? Well, in 1865, he changed career to become a highwayman, a bush ranger, a cattle rustler, a stick-up merchant. Wherever you live, you'll have a name for it. In Scotland, we just say it was Faye Dundee. The Fifers have to get a break sometime after all. What makes you take a decision like that? This wasn't a thoughtless Ned who through inadequacy fell through the educational cracks in a life of crime. This was an educated, well-mannered young man who chose to leave society. Now that's a big call. Apparently, in 1865, he'd been working in a pub and the landlord owed some back wages. Take him to the small claims court, I hear you say. James did the next best thing. He and two accomplices held the publican up at gunpoint, injuring him in the process. Apparently, they got away with three cabbage tree hats, two pairs of riding breeks, one pair of boots, a gun, a shirt, a bottle of whiskey and 14 pounds of flour. Obviously, he took the barter system approach to highway robbery. A slightly different story about why this happy-go-lucky, educated young man decided on a life of crime was that, unhappy in his apprenticeship, he and two guys that he met had a go at shearing sheep. Now, none of them had done it before, and the farmer refused to pay them because their job was rubbish. When James asked for wages, he just happened to have a rifle in his hand. It wasn't aimed. Then they held up the hotel, and that's when the publican was accidentally shot in the face and the government offered £50 hard cash for his apprehension. McPherson left his two mates and headed for New South Wales. There was a more experienced bushranger gang led by a chap called Ben Hall, and James wanted to sign up with them. 
Now, everyone who's ever tried getting a job in a bushranger gang knows the first part of the interview process is to find the bushranger gang. While he was looking, he committed a few more highway robberies, using various aliases and languages, presumably to work up his CV. If you do get to the final interview, you want to have something to show in your portfolio. A few old ups in, he now had a horse. Needless to say, he also had the police on his trail, led by one Inspector Sir Frederick Pottinger. Oh, ho, ho, ho. they had a few scrapes and skirmishes, let me tell you. The last one was when Macpherson had lost his horse and was on foot. They exchanged shots with each other before Macpherson escaped. How he managed to escape on foot from an armed police officer on horseback, I have no idea. Other than to say that James Macpherson could outrun a horse. Alan Wells, Moscow Olympics. Having shrugged off the polis, he headed for the bush west of Sydney and quietly sat down by the Lachlan River, presumably named after the Scott Lachlan Macquarie. James was enjoying the pleasure of a good book, but there's an interesting plot twist. It turns out that he hadn't shrugged off the polis at all and he was surrounded. Pottinger's information and an Aboriginal tracker meant that on the 28th of February 1865, a police patrol surrounded them in a billabong creek northwest of Forbes. You just knew there'd be a billabong involved someplace. His captors were surprised at his unassuming appearance, but he did have a mark on his arm where Pottinger had wounded him. He was sent to Sydney for trial on a charge of shooting at Pottinger, but before the trial, Pottinger accidentally shot himself. Did? Hold on, how do we know that he hasn't done something like that before? With both the witness and the victim dead, the case against Macpherson was dropped. Woohoo! He's off the hook! Oh no, he's not. Queensland want him extradited for holding up that publican. Bugger. He was put on a boat to be sent north to Queensland for trial. But when the ship docked at Mackay on its way to Rockhampton, Macpherson did a Harry Houdini trick. And all that was left were his leg irons nailed to a tree with a note that read, Presented to the Queensland Government with the wild Scotchman's best thanks, that gentleman having no further use for them, the articles being found to be rather cumbersome to transit in this age of enlightenment and progress. Many thanks. Adieu. Oh, those school lessons came in handy right enough. His guard was suspended and James McPherson stole a horse and got up to his old tricks. Sometimes, local folks would give shelter to this outlaw. Don't do it, kids. His main activity now became robbing mailmen. You see, the mail was carried by horseback mailmen who had to face the harsh Queensland bush and weather, the risk of sandstorms or landslides, and every scary, stingy, creepy crawly that Queensland has to offer. All the while, having to look out this way and that for the wild Scotchman. Sometimes, if he was missing a key piece of equipment, Macpherson would steal it from the mailman, but he would give it back later. Pat McCullum seems to have been a regular victim. The wild Scotchman would help himself to Pat's gear and then return it with a note such as, this is Pat McCullum's saddle, see that it gets back. He was known to collect together the personal mail that he'd taken and forward it to the rightful recipient. You see, it was the cash contained in the letters that he needed. The letters, or the cheques, were no use to him. Once, Macpherson gave his regular victim, poor old Pat McCullum, a letter duly stamped and sealed, addressed to His Excellency Sir George Ferguson Bowen. That's the Governor of Queensland and with it, a package that was to be given to a Mr Bly. Once McCullum promised to post the first and deliver the second, Macpherson let him go. 
Now, it turns out that the package contained the useless cheques taken out of the local mail and the letter to His Excellency, duly posted, contained statewide cheques for £1,700 with the explanation that they were of no use to the wild Scotsman. The price of Macpherson's head went up to £250. Now, even when the baddie is a nice baddie, he gets his comeuppance. For James Macpherson, the inevitable capture came not at the hands of wise and wily police, but some sharp-eyed locals from a livestock station near Gingin. A place you'll find my wife at six o'clock every Friday. Somebody answering the description of the wild Scotchman had been seen asking questions about a road that he made no attempt to take. Suspicious. Later, he was seen nearby and two guys who spotted him headed for the local livestock station. Along with the station manager and some other bloke, they set out in hot pursuit. Now, I've only been in Brisbane for a couple of days, but I can tell you, hot is the only type of pursuit that I can imagine in this place. Within five miles, they'd caught up with him. McPherson saw them at full gallop and he hightailed it on a horse tired from the previous day's journey. But the pursuers were gaining. He pulled up to unstrap his double-barreled gun, but one of the pursuers covered him with a rifle and threatened to shoot. With a smile that was as wry as if it had accompanied a good scotch, McPherson said, I give up. I knew you weren't the police by the speed that you followed me down that hill. Apparently, the police couldn't ride at speed without a blue flashing light on the horse's head. McPherson was taken to the Mirabura courthouse, where onlookers were disappointed that he wasn't flash or ferocious looking. Seems like a nice bloke. He was remanded for trial in the Brisbane Supreme Court over the Willis public house robbery, but he was found not guilty. Hold on! If the robbery that started this whole thing off wasn't a robbery at all, none of this ever needed to happen. He could have gone into politics and robbed people legally. As it was, he was returned to Maryborough to face two counts of mail robbery under arms. Now that, there was no getting out of. For each count, he was given 25 year sentences to run concurrently. Harsh. But an example had to be set. He was sent to St Helena Island. Now, that's the other place that I wanted to take you. The island and the remains of the jail are a tourist attraction to this day. But there are no boats running all the time that I'm in Brisbane. What's that about? If you're going to have a tour service that only runs once a month, why would you run it on the same day as the other company who also runs an intermittent tour service runs theirs and make it on the day that I fly to Cairns? Now, I'm flying to Cairns to do one of my live stories of Scotland stand-up shows. Don't worry, this isn't an advert. In fact, by the time this video was live, I'll have done the Cairns gig. But... Remember, I'll be touring the show all over Scotland in autumn, in Perth, Aberdeen, Edinburgh, Dumfries, Gala, Portree, Motherwell, Dunoon, Greenock, Giftick, Dunfermline and more to come. There will be a link for the dates and the tickets in the description below. The point is that he was sent to a prison island surrounded by sharks that tourists can now visit every second Tuesday when there's a full moon, an O in the month, and there's no DFS winter sale. So, you had about as much chance of escaping St Helena Island Prison as you have of getting into it as a tourist today. Unless you met a Queensland policeman with a boat in the pub last night. This is a Queensland policeman. I would tell you his name, but... Mm, we're now going to St Helena Island. It wasn't an easy place to get off. 
But in 1874, James McPherson was trying to get off. A petition was sent to the governor to get him out. Clemency for McPherson. He wasn't that bad a guy. Remember all the checks and private letters that he sent back? So what were the chances of him being let out of this place? Well, let's have a look at the record of the 160th prisoner admitted to St Helena Island. Not long after he arrived, he, along with five others, made an escape attempt, during which James was shot in the wrist. But that wasn't the only incident that James McPherson was punished for during incarceration. July 1870, signing a petition asking for fresh vegetables. October 1870, assaulting a fellow prisoner. January 1871, refusing to work. Again, January 1871, fighting. February 1871, making a noise in his cell. May 1871, disobedience of orders. And again in May 1871, making frivolous complaints. Presumably about the frequency of tourist ferry services from the mainland. Between one thing and another, James McPherson spent a lot of his time in St Helena in solitary confinement. So did they really think that this guy would be given clemency? Well, he was. You see, the petition for his clemency was not only signed by prominent upstanding citizens, but a minister of the church, members of the Queensland Parliament, the stonemason with whom he'd apprenticed in his early years of upright conformity, and McConnell, the owner of Crestbrook Station where his family found work and arrival, and who promised James work once more. His references for an upright life turned out to be much better than the CV for the bushranger job all those years before. When he was eventually released, he went to his father's house, but his dad turned him away. McPherson did indeed go back to Crestbrook where his Queensland story had begun. He worked as a stockman and then later as an overseer. Another manager at the same time, went on to write the 1882 bushranger novel, Robbery Under Arms. I wonder where he got his stories, Faye. In 1878, he married and went on to have seven children. In the early 1890s, he and his family moved to Burktown, where he set up his own business. He was now a well-respected member of the community. But James McPherson didn't die in his bed. In July 1895, on the way home from the funeral of a friend, his horse bolted and fell on him. He didn't die on the spot, but endured three days of torment with his injuries as the helpless doctor administered morphine. Now, whatever you think of James McPherson, on the 23rd of July 1895, he passed for eternal judgment, buried in an unmarked grave in Burktown Cemetery. But his memory continues, as the town of Gingin, where he was captured, commemorates the memory of James McPherson to this day, with a statue, an annual festival, and the wild Scotchman markets every Saturday. Their prices are probably criminal. Like Robin Hood in Nottingham, Rob Roy in the Southern Highlands, or for that matter, Macpherson's namesake in the northeast of Scotland, where he himself originated, he remains a character in the Queensland psyche. If you know the folk songs of Scotland, then you'll have heard another James Macpherson, who was a rogue and a freebooter away back home. His story is quite different, and there's a video about it coming up on screen now. If you become a Patreon member, you support the channel and you get some extra stuff. So why not click the link top right or buy me a coffee in the description below. In the meantime, Hami and Dawkins can be a lamb alive. Cheerio and Rasta.